Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good day everyone. In the vein of the immune system pathology, we shall today try to understand a topic which all of us know a little bit about, but some of which may be very important from the clinical standpoint of view. This is the disorders of the immune system called as hypersensitivity reaction. Now the word hypersensitivity is thrown around quite literally around. They say this person is a little more sensitive to certain one's feelings. But in terms of pathology, we shall discuss what happens at the level of the tissue when there is an excess of immune system reaction. Now when we talk about the definition of a hypersensitivity reaction, it is a pathological reaction which is due to an abnormally active immune system which is on the overdrive. While it is intended to be protective, that is a physiological response, the excessive reaction drives it towards a very destructive path where it can actually bring to a halt the body's mechanism, rendering the patient's morbidity on the overdrive and also in certain cases can cause mortality also. So at the cornerstone of this particular hypersensitivity reaction, you have an excessive or a harmful reaction to a particular antigen. Now there are four types of hypersensitivity reaction which we will try to break down in today's next half an hour or so, but all of them have four important underlying tenets which are that they are elicited by antigens which are outside the body or within the body called as exo and endogenous respectively. Now the exogenous one is something that all of us know, have experienced and gone through the woods which is allergic reactions. Some of us may be allergic to dust as you enter a room. Some of us may be allergic to food substances when we consume them. Okay, this is what is called as an allergic reaction and they are usually from an exogenous source. But endogenous source is something residing within your body and causing such a grievous reaction. A typical example of that is autoimmune reaction or autoimmunity which requires an entire class on its own which we shall discuss in the ensuing few classes. Now what happens here if you ask me it is an imbalance between an effect or response which brings out your inflammatory reaction, your cellular reaction or even the cytokine release vis-a-vis -vis the control mechanisms that are in play to control it. So that imbalance tilts the scale in the favor of an effect or response and the control mechanisms are very sparse. This results in a Im clear imbalance causing the body's immune system to be on the overdrive. Now we also have seen that some people are more susceptible for hypersensitivity than the others. How does that come to play? Let's say a person, as we read in American literature, that person may have reaction to peanut butter. Their vocal cords swell up, they develop hives and rashes, where some others tolerate it well. Now that has to do intrinsically with the person's constitution, which is inheritance of susceptibility genes. This comes in the parlance of HLA or major histocompatibility complex, which we'll also discuss in the ensuing few classes which now for the time being is an important aspect of hypersensitivity. The fourth important tenet in this reaction is the mechanism of tissue injury. Now these reactions will be very similar as which are mounted against an infectious reagents. That is you will not see any difference between a reaction at the level of the tissue to a foreign body versus this particular antigen. So they are similar mechanisms. So if I look under a microscope, I expect to find the same. Having known this, we delve into the four reactions, the important ones ranging from type 1 to type 4. As you can see on your screens, the type 1 reaction is an immediate type of response and as the name itself suggests, it occurs within hours or minutes within an exposure to a particular antigen. It is typified by anaphylaxis, asthma, urticarial reactions, something as banal as pruritus and even bronchospasm. 
it has entirely to do with an IgA mediated response which we will delve into a lot of detail in the ensuing few slides. The second type of hypersensitivity reaction is entirely antibody mediated. The time frame on it is quite variable but basically it is brought about by IgG and IgM type of antibody. Typical examples I would cite is in the RBC territory that is autoimmune hemolytic anemia or AIHA as it is abbreviated or even ITP, immune thrombocytopenic purpura. The type 3 reaction is what is called as immune complex or IC mediated reaction. The time frame on it is quite variable, it may be within a week or maybe 3 weeks after exposure to the antigen. But remember the targets can be quite different in the sense that you can have a very localized reaction such as an Arthus one or maybe a very generalized form of reaction such as a serum sickness or maybe organ specific in the kidney such as a glomerulonephritis or maybe even arthralgia in the joints. This has to do with the deposition of the immune complexes in intricate parts of the tissue which then brings in a lot of inflammation. The last of the reaction or type 4 aptly called delayed type of hypersensitivity reaction that is simply because the time it takes to typify in the tissue is within 2 to 7 days after exposure to the antigen. Let us take the example of contact dermatitis, women wearing artificial jewellery. You will see a reaction around the neck, a rash like reaction or maybe to the good old bindi or vermilion as we call it, they will develop rashes in the area of the forehead. That is a typical type 4 reaction. The pathogenesis on this is quite intricate in the sense that it requires a combination of cell mediated immunity which is usually a T cell mediated cytotoxic reaction or it has to do with the cytokine release which brings and recruits macrophage and inflammatory cells. The other example in this is let us say a maculopapular exanthematous reaction. We will come to the territory of type 1 reaction and try to understand them a little better. As we have discussed earlier, it is a very immediate reaction and it is a rapid immunological response to a very important aspect of the statement which is a previously sensitized individual. That is an important facet of this reaction. Quite simplistically, it is a binding of antigen and IgE mediated response on the mast cells which then portends a particular reaction. Now to understand it, we take very colloquial examples such as rhinitis or running nose. You get exposed to a particular antigen, let us say you walked into an empty theatre which has been closed for a while. You can smell the mildew or the fungal spores and what do you do? You sneeze right away. So, this is a very typical reaction. You can get sore eyes or conjunctivitis after fomite transfer, maybe of an allergic substance, sometimes due to pollen even or dust. More grievous examples exist in the form of hives, urticaria, asthmatic would know this very well, bronchial asthma is triggered, the bronchospasm response is triggered by an immediate type of response which is also brought in by IgE. Little known fact, gastroenteritis also falls under this territory because you consume a large amount of food substances which may have allergic antigens in them and let us say seafood allergy or maybe to the egg. Okay, so, there are a lot of reactions which can take place. The systemic side of it, uh, the more celebrated examples include a bee sting or a wasp allergy. You can see some people swell up after immediately a bee sting or even an ant bite which contains formic acid or it may be due to earlier cited examples such as peanut butter which is used in a sandwich. Now, what happens at the level of the tissues? Now, to understand, let us go right into the respiratory system is something that we, because we understand this system better, we will take the example of the same. You have an exposure to allergen, let us say a pollen during certain seasons, you have the pollen which transmitted through the air reaches your house and you inhale it. What happens? As it goes down your respiratory tract into the terminal bronchioles, the cilia with their beating movement on the surface of this respiratory epithelium traps these pollen substances. As we have indicated in the previous class on immune reactions and the physiological mechanisms underneath, we can see as it is represented on your screens here that the antigen or the protein which is there in these pollen will be exposed to the antigen presenting cells which reside right beneath the basement membrane of the respiratory epithelium. Now, once they are recognized in with the conjunction of HLA or MHC molecule, we know that they present it to your T cells. The naive T cells hence becomes activated and what do they do? 
The T cells are not very quiet fellows. They will also incite their neighbors such as the B cells which also become activated. Now the B cells is a store out of a lot of immunoglobulins and they also are endowed with the property of class switching within the B cells. That is it can elaborate a certain type of immunoglobulin more than the others. Let us say IgA, G, D, E and M. This context will take IgE. This is a preferential class switching towards production of IgE which increases in nexus in the B cells. Some of these B cells will transform into antibody producing factories such as plasma cells which will secrete only polyclonal IgE. This IgE goes in excess, you get hypergamma globinemia. What does it do? All of these IgG bind to the surface of the mast cells which have receptors for the same. Now mast cells to understand just to digress are important cells which are not talked about a lot. They reside in the tissues, they are plenty in the areas of antigen exposure such as GID and the respiratory tract. More importantly though they are storehouse as it is indicated on the schematic representation on your screen. You can see that they have a lot of molecules which can immediately degranulate and liberate into the bloodstream such as histamine and proteases and we know what they do. More importantly perhaps they have a lot of these cell membrane lipids such as your membrane phospholipids which are storehouses for both platelet activating factor as well as arachidonic acid metabolites. Now all of these as a net result result in vasodilatation, vascular leakage and also brings about smooth muscle contraction. The late phase reaction can be quite devastating in the terms of lot of epithelial damage and even bronchospasm. Now having known this background we will go back to the reaction that we were dealing with which is hypersensitivity type 1. Now once the mast cells bind on the surface all these IgE molecules they immediately degranulate and release all of their substances. This is quite an sentinel event in this reaction because what happens downstream is a release of lot of vasoactive amines and lipid mediators which brings in the typical triad of reactions minutes after the repeat exposure to the same antigen and then you have cytokines which are released as a late phase reaction maybe 2 to 24 hours later but that also is clubbed under an immediate reaction and you get after repeat exposure to allergens you will have a repeat reaction. Now what are the examples that we cite under type 1 having known the pathology behind it? We know something called as ATOP. Sometimes in literature we say atopic individuals. ATOP means certain individuals who have a genetic predisposition or susceptibility to develop type 1 reaction more than the others. They also have found out through cross sectional studies that there is a 50 percent history, an antecedent history of families having a similar disorder. Somebody in their family will have a similar manifestation which runs across generations. It has to do with the polymorphisms in the gene located on chromosome number 5 on the long arm 3 1 region. And it has also been found out that much of it is linked to chromosome 6p. So entirely your HLA comes into play and also as we discussed earlier susceptibility because of inheritance of certain genes. Anaphylaxis on the other hand is a more generalized form of this reaction. It can range from shock, when in shock we are talking about more of a vascular response. We also talk about dyspnea which is difficulty in respiration and edema or increase in the fluid in the extracellular space. Now this can be because of food allergens, drugs and the antisera. The type 2 reaction, the type 2 reaction is entirely antibody mediated. We have seen the examples earlier in the table. Let us see what happens at the level of the tissue. These antibodies are directed towards antigens of course but they not necessarily be present on the surface of the cell. It can also be enmeshed within the extracellular matrix. What happens as a net result? The net result could be an entirely destruction of the cell. It can be in a lot of inflammatory response that it brings along with it and then it destroys the cell or the cell itself may be viable but its function is neutered which is called a cellular dysfunction. So there is could be an interference with the function ability of the cell. Now we will discuss this under three important headings as we have seen in the earlier slide. The first mechanism is opsonization and phagocytosis. This is a schematic representation indicating to us how the reaction takes place. For example, you may have a cell on the left end of your screen which contains the antigens and then it of course mounts an antibody response 
by the inflammatory cells targeting it. And you can see on the surface there are immunoglobulin molecules. Now sometimes the complement cascade is activated and important aspect of that complement is C3B is an opsonin. C3B potentiates this reaction and makes it a tasty target for your phagocytes to come and devour it. The phagocytes respond of course in kind by recognizing the FC receptor and they internalize or eat up the cell. Once these cells of interest are consumed, they of course will be broken down by a lot of hydrolytic and lysosomal enzymes within the cells and then the cell is completely scavenged off. This sort of example in the clinical parlance, you see it with transfusion reaction, mismatched one, maybe ABO or RH, hemolytic disease of newborn which we have seen in the context of RH negative pregnancy, autoimmune hemolytic anemia and ITP are very important examples where you will see a reduction in the RBC and the platelet count because most of them are devoured by the macrophages in the spleen and then of course drug reaction because drug itself can act like a haptin and then a antibody response can be mounted against the cell. The second mechanism is more complement mediated. Let us say the, as you are seeing on the left side of your screen, you will see a cell membrane or extracellular matrix which harbors the antigen and it is inciting an antibody reaction to the same. Along with the antibody, there are certain elements of the complement which are brought in and of course complements are attractants for polymorphs or neutrophils. Now neutrophils will then be recruited to the site and as we have discussed in acute inflammation classes, these will release a lot of molecules from their primary and secondary granules such as proteases, uh, neutrophil reactive oxygen species which brings in a lot of inflammation and the end result is usually tissue injury. The examples I would cite here is typically the ones to do with NFLR toxins such as glomerulonephritis, rejection of the graft which we will also discuss in due course of immunity classes and also good pasture syndrome, a typical example where the lung and the kidney are simultaneously affected. So this is a clinical example for complement mediated inflammation in type 2 reaction. The third wing of this is cellular interference which is again antibody dependent but the underlying pathology is dissimilar. In the sense, we will take the example on the left side of your screen which is an example for hyperthyroidism or Graves disease. We see that there are antibodies which are mounted against your TSH receptors on epithelial cells of the thyroid follicles. As a response to this, your TSH levels begin to drop off. What happens then? The negative feedback loop is affected and T3, T4 hormones are secreted in excess which causes the hyperthyroid symptoms of course. But you can see without the hormone being released that is TSH, your, TS, your T3, T4 begin to increase a lot and the clinical manifestation do occur. Also on the right side of the screen you can see an example of myasthenia gravis. Now this condition is mainly to do at the level of the synapse where there are antibodies against acetylcholine receptors. This important neurotransmitter is now neutralized. The patient will have motor symptoms as a result of the same. So these are examples for cellular mediated cell dysfunction. The type 3 hypersensitivity reaction, a lot of this has to do with the joints and in the kidneys which we will discuss in a bit. The prototype which was discovered maybe a century back, a little trivia on this, it was called as acute serum sickness and it was coined by Clement Vaupiquet in the early 1900s. A trivia on it says that the patients with diphtheria were treated with a horse serum. The horse serum actually was used to harvest a lot of antibodies and these antibodies were injected back into the patients with diphtheria. And he saw that the patient developed rashes, a lot of reactions systemic and local and he called it localized Arthur's reaction. Now of course as time has evolved and a lot of discoveries, we also know more systemic aspects of this and we also know that they have to do with the antibodies such as IgG and IgM and also the complement components such as C3. Again examples one would cite is systemic lupus erythematosus which we will discuss in the context of autoimmunity, post streptococcal glomerular nephritis or PSGN and of course vasculitis such as polyarteritis nodosa. Now this entirely has to do with what is called as antigen antibody complex formation simply put as immune complex formation in the circulation. Now these will 
move along with the bloodstream and get deposited at certain sites of interest. And once they are deposited there, they will elicit an inflammatory response and this inflammatory response will then damage the underlying tissue. So this is the cornerstone of type 3 hypersensitivity reaction. Most of these ICs or immune complexes are in the circulation and they get deposited in the left vessel wall. Some of them are of course planted antigens which are also called as in situ immune complexes. It goes in three important phases if we want to understand it even further which is called as phase 1, 2 and 3. Phase 1 is merely the formation of complexes as it is indicated on the schematic representation on your screen there. You have an immune complex formation which is mainly to do with antigens in the bloodstream. Your B cells will react, get transformed into an active B cell, release antibodies. Also the plasma cells will elaborate antibodies and this complex when it binds together will circulate in your blood. Phase 2 is where these ICs get deposited in the tissues. Mostly it is to do on the endothelium or between the lining of the epithelial cells. What it importantly does is also recruits a lot of complement components and also inflammatory cells such as neutrophils. Now you have a more complex reaction taking place at the level of the tissue. It is seen that when the antigen antibody complex has a larger component of an antigen or antigen excess IC as it is called, it is supposed to be more potent in triggering this particular response. An antibody excess may not be that important or the same level of antigen antibody may not be as important as antigen excess. Now the, the type 3 hypersensitive reaction if you have seen the earlier examples that one cited, it has to do with the organs which filter the blood at a very high pressure because these are areas or crevices where it can easily develop because of the rapid filtering rate. Now the, um, now the example that jumps to our mind straight away are the kidneys, the glomerular, the intrinsic structure is so intricate that easily you can have the immune complexes deposit there and also the joints, the synovium and the underlying tissue which filters the blood at a very rapid rate is also the site for deposition of ICs. Of course, not surprisingly you will have the examples such as glomerular nephritis and also arthritis as clinical example for type 3 hypersensitivity reaction. Now the last of this results are in phase 3 of hypersensitivity type 3 is to do with inflammation and tissue injury. Of course, we have seen the formation of immune complexes on the surface which recruits a lot of inflammatory cells which release proteases and other important enzymes which brings in vasculitis or tubulitis in the region of where the immune complexes have indeed deposited. So this results in the clinical manifestation which is usually 10 to 15 days or so after the administration of the antigen and it is indicated by the clinical triad of fever, joint pains or even urticarial type of rashes that one can see in the body. If you want to look at the microscopy level at the type of type 3 reaction, you have something like this. It is an h &E image, you can see what is called as a necrotizing vasculitis. As we have seen in the earlier schematic representation, if you extrapolate that knowledge right here, you will see the deposition of neutrophils, immune complexes, complement and plasma protein which have exuded through the plasma. This results in a very smudgy eosinophilic material that you can see on your screen there. It is called as fibrinoid necrosis which is fibrin like, so it is called fibrinoid. Of course, we cannot see the immune complexes with light microscopy require an ancillary test. We take of course the help of immunofluorescence here in the kidney as you can see in the left side of the screen it is an immune complex formation. So small granular deposits, lumpy deposits which are seen along the basement membrane and subepithelial region is indicative of immune complex. The image on your right is per adic acid shift or PAS which is important to highlight the hypercellular nature and increase in the cellularity of the kidney. Type 4 is the last of the reaction or hypersensitivity reaction. We call it delayed as we have discussed earlier because of the time frame on it is quite after let us say a week or so. It is important to realize that it is a T cell mediated response which is caused by inflammation due to cytokine release by CD4 or cell killing directly by CD8 cells. So both of them partake in different modalities. Clinical examples one would cite is rheumatoid arthritis, type 1 diabetes mellitus, inflammatory bowel disease, contact dermatitis. There is a litany of these conditions but there are big four of these which 
one needs to bear in mind when you are talking about the pathophysiology of type 4 reaction. Now, CD4 T cell mediated aspect of this reaction is the delayed hypersensitivity which is typified by the schematic representation on your screen. As you can see, the antigen presenting cells in the tissue which bears the antigen and it gets internalized. Now, these antigens are then processed and made palatable to present the T cells which then again transform from the good old naive T cells to an activated form and one of the activated form is CD4 T cells. Now, these CD4 T cells are storehouse of your cytokines which are released and these cytokines are important recruiters of inflammatory cells. Your neutrophils are the most eager beavers of the lot and then they come to play. Now, neutrophils once they reach the level of the tissue, they cause tissue damage because of the reactivity to certain tissues. You can have subgroups such as Th1 or Th17 type of helper T cells. Now, when you have an excess of Th1, it is said that a lot of macrophages are activated, whereas Th17 recruits a lot of neutrophils. So, based upon the preference for this in the tissue at the level of light microscopy, you can see an excess of macrophage or neutrophils. Again, a reaction for this is MAN2 or tuberculin reaction, which we will discuss a lot of detail much later. The second facet of type 4 hypersensitivity reaction is CD8 T cell mediated cytotoxicity. Now, as discussed in the earlier class, CD8 1 cells are very potent ones. They, are, they also harbinger of a lot of enzymes to directly attack the cells and devour them. Now, here in your schematic representation, you can see that the antigen presenting cells will contain and process a lot of antigens presented to your T cells and we know that CD8 cells, if you remember the previous class, recognizes these antigens with the context of HLA class 1. Now, this class restriction means your CD8 cells become hyperplastic or increase in number as it is indicated on your screen say. Once they increase, their important contents are also released such as perforins which basically perforate the cell membranes of the cells of interest and granzymes, these are important enzymes which are hydrolytic in nature. They activate very important enzyme within the target cell called as caspases and from your knowledge from apoptosis, you know that caspases are the enzyme which cause programmed cell death or apoptosis. It also has a smaller mechanism at play such as a FAS ligand which binds to the FAS molecule on the surface of the cell and death domain pathway or apoptosis is triggered. So, both the intrinsic and the extrinsic pathway of cell death are triggered by CD8 molecules resulting in death of the cells. An important example of this is viral infections where the virus multiplies within the nucleus of the host cells and it takes the help of CD8 cells to bring down this particular parasite. So, this brings us to the end of this class on hypersensitivity reactions. Now, important to know are type 1, 2, 3 and 4 and each of their mechanisms and the clinical examples for the same. Thank you, have a good day.